Welcome to our Awareness Week webinar. Today's topic is hearing and acoustic neuroma, which we've chosen to follow our AN Awareness Week focus of Sound Off for AN. We are honored to welcome Dr. Jorge Gonzalez, Associate Professor and Director of Audiology in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at Emory University Hospital Midtown, and Dr. Joseph Montano, Professor of Audiology and Director of Hearing and Speech at Weill Cornell Medicine. I'm Melissa Bombick, the Communications Specialist for the Acoustic Neuroma Association, and I will act as your moderator today. Before we begin, I want to welcome everyone to our seventh annual AN Awareness Week. Our efforts to inform and educate others about acoustic neuroma and spread awareness generally hit a peak during this week each year. We are working hard to share information along with patient stories and pictures to let people see what our AN community looks like and communicate some different experiences. We hope you'll join us by liking and sharing our posts and tagging others on social media to spread the word. Another note, all attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type them into the questions box on the control panel on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can after the presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio using your computer speakers, please feel free to call in using the phone number and access code on your control panel. There will be a recording of this webinar that includes audio and all PowerPoint slides available next week on the ANA website. We'll also be adding captions to that recording. Please watch our social media sites for notification that the webinar has been uploaded and is available for viewing. The Acoustic Neuroma Association, the premier resource to the acoustic neuroma community, informs, educates, and supports those affected by acoustic neuroma brain tumors. It's ANA's vision to continually improve the lives of acoustic neuroma patients and their families through communication, support, innovation, and partnerships with the medical community. We want to offer a big thank you to our annual sponsors whose funds help advance AN education and support as well as increase AN awareness. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Montano, Montano is a professor of audiology and director of hearing and speech at Weill Cornell Medicine. He received his master's degree from New York University, his doctorate of education in audiology from Teachers College, Columbia University, and is certified in audiology through the American Speech and Language Hearing Association. Dr. Montana, Montana's clinical expertise is audiologic rehabilitation with particular interest in adjustment to adult onset hearing loss, hearing assistive technology systems, and hearing aids. Dr. Gonzalez is an Associate Professor and Director of Audiology in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at Emory University Hospital Midtown. In these capacities, Dr. Gonzalez works as an educator, clinician, and researcher. Dr. Gonzalez earned his master's degree from the University of South Florida and his Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Virginia. It's now my pleasure to get started and turn the webinar over to Dr. Gonzalez, who's going to get us started. Let me go ahead and give the screen controls to you, Dr. Gonzalez. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, everyone, for uh, being here and uh, listening to our presentation. It's really an honor and a, and a privilege to be here uh, giving uh, the talk for the Acoustic Neuroma Association, so thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do, I, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit and make sure that we were all talking sort of the same language. One of the things I've sort of found over the years in both uh, teaching uh, audiology and also working with patients with audiology is there's a little bit of misunderstanding about how certain things work. So I really wanted to talk first off about the acoustic neuroma and how we sort of view this from the perspective of the audiologist. So initially what we have to remember is that this really is a benign tumor that originates in the, in the myelin sheath around the acoustic or and or vestibular nerve or really cranial nerve number eight uh, one of the things that also we have to remember though is that when we talk about a nerve a nerve is really nothing more than a group of neurons that are receiving signals from sensors like the sensors for pain and touch and, and uh, temperature and so on or the eyes or the nose or the ears or they're sending signals uh, to the muscles in the body so that's how we basically receive information. That's also how we affect a change in our environment or response in some way to the things that our body is perceiving. And all those neurons that are joined together to form that nerve trunk are actually basically little electrical conductors that are surrounded by a fatty sheath called myelin, 
which helps the signal actually travel more quickly. That's actually one of the nice components that allow the signal to travel as quickly as they do and us to be able to sense things almost immediately when we do. And the myelin that is in, around those neurons in the areas of outside of the brain and the spinal cord are made by cells that are called Schwann cells that are specific to making these fat, fatty sheaths around the neuron. And so that's why we talk about schwannomas, uh, vestibular schwannomas as sort of uh, a corollary name or an analogous name to what we use with acoustic neuromas. Now, the interesting thing about that is that when we talk about these things, we have to remember that each neuron is surrounded by that Schwann cell, surrounded by that myelin, and this is really an important component in, in one of the sort of understandings of how this works. Now, when we look at acoustic neuromas, one of the things that we have to remember is that it can affect the hearing nerve a couple of different ways, okay? So first off, when we talk about this, we have to remember that the acoustic nerve actually travels, or the eighth cranial nerve, travels through a thing we call the internal auditory canal. That's basically a bony uh, tube that is in, in the skull that actually goes from the ear into the brain, the areas of the brain. That's only about eight millimeters long, about 3.7 millimeters in diameter. And so it's not a very large area, not a very large tube, but inside of that, we actually have the auditory and vestibular nerve, we have the facial nerve or the seventh cranial nerve, and we have uh, arteries and veins that are actually going toward those structures of the inner ear. And so those are actually, there's a lot of different things that are going on inside of that. So what happens when we're dealing with an acoustic neuroma, what we're really dealing with is a mass that is growing outside of that neuron or the nerve, excuse me. And what it does is it actually will go ahead and as it grows, it continues to grow. What it does is it takes up more of the space within the internal auditory canal. And in doing so, what it does is it puts pressure on the nerve and then disrupts the neural signals to the brain. Now, it, this is the, sort of the simplistic view, and one of the things that we have to remember is that when we look at this, it's actually a little bit more involved than that. The information that we have about, and, and I talked about earlier about the way that myelin surrounds each of the neurons, is that when we talk about that, we don't know specifically where those uh, tumors are actually originating. It might be on the periphery, on the outside part, it might be more toward the middle, and so when we have that, it's not a simple matter of removing the tumor, the nerve comes back to its resting point and everything works great again. What we have to remember is that some of that may have grown in or it originated from the my myelin within the nerve itself, and therefore it's actually acting on fibers within the nerve that are also disrupting sound. So that's why sometimes if you have the surgical procedure done to remove an aroma, it doesn't always necessarily fix the hearing and make everything back to normal, okay? So those are a couple of points that I wanted to make sure that we all sort of have as under our belts in terms of understanding how this works out. So we all know that not everybody's gonna experience the same symptoms that we have, but in general, what we experience when an individual has an acoustic neuroma are really a constellation of things, but generally speaking, we might uh, have someone experiencing imbalance or vertigo, Experience, and vertigo by meaning a definition by definition is a sensation of movement when you yourself are not actually moving. Uh, secondarily, we may have tinnitus or a ringing or buzzing noise in the ear. And uh, usually that is uh, something that's fairly constant, although individuals can have tinnitus even with normal hearing and no acoustic neuroma, as long as it's not something that's constant. Everybody gets a little ring every, you know, so often for 10 or 20 seconds. I'm talking about a constant prolonged uh, series of noises that are in the ear that are not being generated by other signals. Thirdly, we have a hearing loss, which is sensory neural, meaning that it is something that's affecting the transmission of signals up to the brain. It's not sound having a problem getting into the ear itself or the inner ear. It's a problem from the inner ear going up to the, br the brain. And then lastly, we may have, uh, if the, the facial nerve is involved, we may have some facial weakness or numbness. So these are some of the general symptoms that we are going to have through this. Now, if we have these symptoms, clearly an individual should seek medical attention for that, and that can really be done a couple of different ways. And while the scope of this is really hearing, there are a couple of things that can be done. So imbalance and vertigo is generally assessed through a vestibular or balance evaluation. Um, tinnitus or hearing loss is usually assessed through audiometry, and other symptoms would generally be assessed by your physician. So typically the first two, the vertigo, uh, assessments and the tinnitus and hearing assessments are really done uh, with the assistance of an audiologist who may or may not be working in direct uh, uh, affiliation with a physician. 
And th that's what we're trying to present and try to figure out ways that we can come up with an explanation about why the symptoms are actually there. And so when we talk about hearing tests, we really talk about the assessment is done uh, and the measurements that we make are do it through a thing we call an audiogram. Now, for those of us who have had hearing tests, this is a, a fairly standard type of example of what we're looking for with this. But what we have is effectively on this graph plotting from left to right, we're dealing with frequency. Low frequencies or low pitches are on the left-hand side. High frequencies or high pitches are on the right. If you want to think of a piano, we have basically the bass end on the left. We have the treble sounds on the right. And then vertically, we have basically the intensity. Soft sounds are toward the top. Loud sounds are toward the bottom. So effectively, when you, an individual responds, what we're looking for is to see um, where they're responding at these different frequencies. So in each of those frequencies will, are components that make up different sounds. So effectively, when an individual or patient responds, we mark the appropriate decibel level or intensity at which they respond, and then that gives us a graph of what the hearing looks like. And so effectively, the worse the hearing is, the lower on the graph those things are going to show up. And so we basically, in audiology, we actually grade these things out in different capacities in terms of the type of hearing loss. We talk about hearing loss that might be mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe, or profound. Other ways that that can be assessed is actually using percentages. Audiologists, we tend not to use that because there's some complications in how that's done, and that doesn't always necessarily reflect effectively what the hearing capacity is, but we talk about them in really these gradations. Another thing to kind of consider as well is that when we look at the different frequency responses for speech sounds, in general, vowel sounds tend to be low frequency, like the ooh, the ah, the uh, and consonant sounds tend to be higher frequencies, such as the s in the s, the t in the t, the ch in the ch. And so when we're listening for words, we basically are taking sounds from a, a range of different frequencies and putting those complex sounds together to understand what the word may or may not be that we're listening for. And so whenever we have hearing losses, hearing losses in the low frequencies will affect our understanding of words because we lose volume or power, while high frequency losses, we tend to lose clarity because of the fact that we don't have the, the consonants, which are what give us the distinction between words. One of the other things that we do when we're looking at uh, audiological evaluations, we're also trying to figure out what, how an individual is able to uh, recognize differences between words. We want to see how well an individual can understand and hear speech. So another test that we do is we present them with a series of words. For example, say the word house, say the word cat, say the word ball, things of that nature, and see how the individual responds. And those give us an indication of how the hearing is actually uh, functioning. And so when we look at these things, those are the different characteristics that we will find that will uh, either tell us whether hearing is normal or whether there's some abnormality in hearing loss or in hearing function, excuse me. So when we look at these things, one of the things that we have to sort of take into account is that when we're looking at the hearing patterns that we exhibit for an individual who has an acoustic neuroma, there's a wide range of different things that we may actually hear. So, or how our hearing may represent itself, excuse me. So what I, what I ended up doing as I was going through this and making this presentation, I figured it might be a nice thing not to just talk about, well, you may have this or you may have that. I wanted to actually show a couple of different cases that we have to sort of give a representation of what might be a very typical uh, type of a hearing loss, knowing that, of course, this is going to vary. So I'll bring up one patient in particular. So a patient that we had... Uh, patient EF, who was a 74-year-old female. Now, interestingly, when uh, she was first seen, the symptoms that she had was she felt like she had some ringing in her ears, uh, in her left ear, excuse me, and also she felt like she had an ear infection. A lot of times when people have ear infections, the ear might feel stuffed up, and so when it feels stuffed up like that, they, they can sense that uh, as well. She didn't notice any dizziness. She didn't notice any fullness. A hearing test that uh, followed actually found that she did have an asymmetrical hearing loss, in this case, her right ear. Okay, So she, she didn't have a left ear infection. She actually had a, a, a problem in hearing in the right ear. This was actually a sensory hearing loss that we exhibited, or she exhibited in this case. Now, whenever we see these things, we look for the differences. In this case, the X's, the blue X's represent the left ear, while the red triangles and circles actually represent the right ear. And if you look at that, 
we had effectively pretty normal hearing through 2000 hertz and then sort of dropping off in the left ear to a moderately severe or severe loss. And that kind of hearing loss is not unusual for somebody over the age of 60. We start to lose high frequency hearing as we age. But what was interesting with her was that we had a low frequency hearing loss in the right side. And so that right ear actually was a sensory loss. It was not a conductive loss like we would expect with a, an ear infection of some kind. Also, we note that we had 100% understanding of the words here for word recognition, 100% in the left ear. The right ear was at 52%. So there was a pretty notable difference between that. Anytime we see large differences in hearing function between one ear and the other, or large differences in understanding of words between one ear and the other, then we can actually, it starts to make us wonder as to whether or not there's an acoustic neuroma or something else going on behind the inner ear. And what was found was she actually had a relatively small acoustic neuroma in the right ear. It was only three millimeters by two millimeters. Relatively small in size, categorized as a, a small a tumor itself. But even with something that small, you notice that there's a very large difference between the ears in this case. What ended up happening with her, the, the plan for her, based on a couple of different factors, is one of the approach they took with her was watch and wait. So knowing that neuromas tend to be fairly slow growing, they wanted to wait and in a year go ahead and reassess how she was doing. And so that's one example of, uh, of how the uh, hearing might be affected. Secondarily, we have a 64-year-old. This one initially had complaints of dizziness and hearing loss in the left ear back in 2016. Her balance testing turned out to be completely normal, but when we did an evaluation of her, well, everything looked pretty good. So effectively, there was no real serious concerns with her that were raised at the time that she was evaluated. This was an outside test that was done. Her speech was good, slight differences in hearing uh, between the right and the left ear at the low frequencies, but nothing major. It was found actually after this, uh, uh, prior to the hearing test when the scanning was done, but you can see that there wasn't much of a change, but we had a five by three millimeter acoustic neuroma. So she had something there that was present, but it wasn't anything that was really impacting too much. In 2019, just recently actually, it was shown that she actually had that grow a little bit, a little bit two millimeters in length uh, and actually a little bit more in width. And then that change actually created this. So what you'll notice is the right ear basically stayed the same. We start to see a shift in understanding in the left ear, so 100% down to 80. And then you start to see a larger difference in the responses, particularly here at 2,000 hertz and at 1,000 hertz and at 3,000 hertz, where the left ear starts to drop. And so you can see that even just a subtle change of about 2 millimeters, which is relatively small, uh, actually creates a pretty significant change in this case with this individual. This individual was going to go through some radiation. Gamma knife was going to be the plan to try to, to see if we can sort of minimize its growth or kind of try to get it back in check. Thirdly, I have a 44-year-old female who back in 2018, in January, complained of an echo or reverb sound in her right ear, had some nasal issues at the time. The, the echo and the reverb uh, wasn't really followed up. Uh, she did go through some surgery uh, for that. At the time of her, uh, about 10 months later, this is in November, you can see that both the right ear and the left ear actually have fairly normal hearing. Okay, everything is 20 decibels or 25 decibels and softer, which would suggest normal hearing sensitivity. Understanding of speech was almost perfect in both ears. Then what ended up happening in January, just two months later, she actually noticed a, a worsening of her hearing. And what ended up happening at that stage was we had this. So left ear response was completely normal. However, the right ear, we ended up and ended up with a, prof a severe to profound hearing loss uh, across the board. Uh, unable to respond to words, couldn't get uh, her responses in, uh, at all to, to the words in the right ear. So even in just those, those couple of months, there was a significant difference in what her hearing was like. Now, what was found was that she had a 1.9 by 0.7 by 0.7 centimeter acoustic neuroma on the right side. Now, if you think about this, this is a 1.9 centimeter. The other ones are two, two millimeters and three millimeters in the previous examples. So you can see that there's a, very, a lot of variability between what the size of the tumor is going to do and what effect it's going to have actually on the hearing. There's a lot of things that we have to sort of take into account when we're dealing with patients. With her, what they ended up doing, because the hearing was so poor in the right ear, the, the decision was made to go with the translabyrinthine resection. They were just going to go right through the ear, 
take out the tumor, effectively get rid of the, the inner ear system itself and the middle ear uh, itself, and then basically just work with that since there was nothing usable in that case. So this is a pretty significant uh, change in hearing that we have in this case. And lastly, I have a 22-year-old female. Actually, this is a 22-year-old female with long-standing hearing loss in the right ear. And we have a history with her of an acoustic neuroma, and in her case, 2.4 centimeters by 1.8 by 1.3 centimeters in size. And the hearing pattern that we exhibited with her looked like this. Left ear looks perfectly normal all the way across the board. And if you look at the right ear, the right ear, we basically have a moderately severe loss almost across the board, back up to normal in the highest frequency. 4% understanding in the right ear, while 100% understanding in the left. And so you would think that this is a pretty notable difference. Now, the thing that's very interesting about this patient is that she's actually been diagnosed back in 2010 with neurof neurofibromatosis type 2, or NF2. NF2 is very commonly uh, presented with bilateral acoustic neuromas, and she actually has a 1.3 by 0.6 by 0.6 centimeter acoustic neuroma, acoustic neuroma on the left. And if you look at that, even with that size neuroma, which in the previous patient, it's almost similar size, there was a notable decrease in hearing sensitivity on this side in the left ear. Even with that, there's no effect whatsoever on her hearing. So that's one of the challenges that we always have in audiology, working with trying to determine what we're going to expect with hearing losses and then in, order, in terms of how to deal with that. So there's a lot of things that, that I find very interesting about neuromas and dealing with them because of these variabilities. So what do we do to manage this hearing loss? Well, effectively, sensor neural hearing losses that result from acoustic neuromas really can't often be remedied. There's only little things that we can do depending upon what we're, what's the situation is. In some cases, tumor resection, in some cases, gamma knife can remove those things. And, uh, but what we have to do really is, on the audiological side is try to overcome the hearing deficit, usually through some kind of amplification. What we're trying to do with that is make sounds easier to hear. There's a lot of different styles of hearing aids that go in the ear, behind the ear. Some are even anchored to the bone. And what those basically do is they try to amplify sound. But we have to remember that not every style of hearing aid is appropriate for your loss. The smallest hearing aids, while some people really want something tiny that you can't see, that doesn't necessarily work for a profound hearing loss. And all, additionally, these aren't the same hearing aids that we had from, uh, I'm gonna go back here, sorry. Um, so the hearing aids that we had before, they, nowadays we connect to, to your cell phone. We have things that can help with tinnitus symptoms by presenting different noises to mask out. Uh, we have a, range, a wide range of colors or including camouflage. Some of the hearing aids nowadays can actually check your heart rate. They'll tell you if you've fallen. They'll call your, your family members to let them know you've fallen. Some are even working on counting your steps. So there's a lot of things that we can do with these. But the basic idea is we still are trying to overcome the loss. So what we as audiologists recommend in a very simple sense is if you have hearing loss that exists and if you're likely to benefit, we will recommend hearing aids. If we have hearing loss in both ears, we generally amp recommend amplifying both because it's going to help you with localizing sound in the environment. If you only have one hearing aid, it's a lot harder to do. It's also better to understand speech in the presence of noise uh, when we have two hearing aids. And then if you only have one ear that's asymmetric or one loss, uh, we either aid the poorer ear we have cross amplification that sends sound to the better ear. We can maybe go with a, an integrated bone anchored hearing aid or no hearing aid at all. So we have to consider a couple of different things. Some of these sounds are going to be uh, things are you're going to hear things you may not have heard before because of the acoustic neuroma. Some of those might be bothersome, but there's still sounds you need to hear. Crickets and birds, some of those frequencies are still needed for consonants. So hearing them is not necessarily a bad thing. But sometimes there are things you don't want to hear, road noise, background noise. And while we try to minimize that, hearing aids do a better job of getting rid of those. Uh, it's not always going to be perfect. The basic thing we have to remember is that they're not going to restore hearing to its previous state. We're really trying to overcome the hearing loss you have. They may not always improve understanding, but you also have to remember that there's a time of adjustment to maximize the hearing aids. And working with your audiologist is really the best way uh, to do that. So a couple things that to remember about hearing and acoustic neuroma, there's no specific pattern. Tiny tumors can give a significant hearing loss, while notable tumors can cause no hearing loss whatsoever. It's important not to overlook hearing and or other related symptoms. Do not overlook tinnitus, vertigo, or fullness, especially if the symptoms are on one side. 
if you see any of these or note these symptoms, definitely make sure you see an audiologist or an otologist. And if hearing aids are recommended, consider using them. They're not a bad thing necessarily. They're there to work with you. While they're not perfect, they will help you uh, communicate overall. And so I do thank you for your attention, and I would now like to hope you enjoy Dr. Montana's presentation as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez. Let's go ahead and uh, make Dr. Montano the presenter. Okay. Are we, are we there? Yep, we're there. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thanks, Dr. Gonzalez. That was fantastic. Uh, I'd like to, to also just say about hearing aids and uh, um, what he just said about uh, the stigma. Uh, there are lots of emotional components that we deal with when we deal with hearing loss. And that's kind of the area that I'd like to, to talk about today. Um, I'm gonna focus on unilateral hearing loss. And, and the reason I chose unilateral hearing loss is because that is the outcome of many people with acoustic neuromas. Uh, when you look at the case studies that Dr. Gonzalez presented, I think two out of the four cases were pure unilateral hearing loss with the, the better ear being normal. And one was an asymmetrical hearing loss where the, the better ear did have some hearing loss, but was significantly better than the poorer ear. Uh, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that we can look at audiograms, uh, and I've looked at thousands of them, but you can't really ever predict how somebody is going to be able to function with their hearing loss. That's the tricky part. The tricky part is two people can have the exact same hear <coughs> hearing loss, but it affects them differently. Years ago, I worked at Manhattan Eye, Ear and Throat Hospital, and um, I became aware of a group called SHISH, Self-Help for Hard of Hearing. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Uh, it, it later became the Hearing Loss Association of America. And along with one of my patients, we created a local chapter of the SHISH organization, and that the HLA chapter now in New York City is the one that we created back in the 1980s. And one of the things I've learned from my association with patients on a support level, you know, on a consumer level, is that the hearing loss is unpredictable. How somebody will respond to hearing loss, I'm yet to figure that out. So what we need to do as audiologists is to learn who the patient is and try to come up with some kind of a plan that is going to uh, allow a person to function uh, the best with their hearing loss. So as you saw with Dr. Gonzalez's audiograms, this is a common look to hearing tests. The blue lines there represent that hearing on the left side is within normal limits. The red triangles down on the bottom indicate that there's no hearing, no functional hearing in that right ear. So here's a person who's got great hearing in the left ear and no hearing in the right ear. Throughout um, their, their course of evaluation, I am sure that they've come across people who have said things to them like, you've got one good ear, don't worry, everything will be fine. You still can hear out of that good ear. We've come to learn that that is not exactly true. Uh, we do know that you can hear well out of uh, the good ear, but that doesn't mean that your communication isn't impacted. So unilateral hearing loss refers to hearing loss that's in one ear and hearing within normal limits in the other. Uh, it could range from a few decibel difference to total deafness. And it's estimated that about 7.2% of the people with hearing loss have a unilateral hearing loss. And out of that, only about 2% use amplification. So we've got a very small number of people who are using amplification with unilateral hearing loss, even though there is technology that can be very helpful. My friend Sam Triken says, it's not hearing loss, it's a communication loss. And what's interesting about Sam is that he is a psychologist with bilateral severe hearing loss. And he has gone around the country 
talking to people with hearing loss and talking about the effects that hearing loss has on communication because it affects the person with hearing loss, it affects the family, it, it affects the friends, it affects interaction in all different environments. So I think thinking about it as a communication loss really makes sense. So one of the things that we really need to do when we're assessing hearing loss is to get a detailed case history um, and make sure that we, we have a good picture of who we're dealing with when we're doing this assessment. We want to carefully assess the unaffected ear. Uh, it's advisable to do interactive frequencies when we're testing people with unilateral hearing loss. And one of the things that, that I always do routinely is assess something called hearing handicap. So self-assessment, um, that is actually asking people how they function with their present hearing. Most hearing loss following acoustic aroma surgery is unilateral. And again, that idea that you've got one good ear, that's, you know, that's great, you've got one good ear, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of your communication will be normal. Um, there was a study uh, that we looked at and let me just, okay. Um, this was done in 2000. They had 21 subjects that had unilateral sudden sensory neural hearing loss, and they completed the HHIA, which stands for the Hearing Handicap Inventory for Adults. And it's a, an inventory with 25 questions that asks, you know, um, uh, because of your hearing loss, do you have difficulty in restaurants, hearing in restaurants? Uh, does your hearing loss prevent you from talking on the telephone? A lot of different types of questions that are either social, talking about social engagement, psychosocial or emotional. So the hearing handicap was found in 86% of the people who had unilateral hearing loss. Um, that's a huge number um, that people experience difficulty as a result difficulty enough that they would feel that they are handicapped as a result of their hearing loss. Whoops. And I did a, a study with a, a colleague of mine when I was at Manhattan Eye Urine Throat Hospital uh, for that exact reason that I had said earlier, because my unilateral people come in and they say, oh, everybody tells me I've got one good ear, but I'm still having problems. So we, we measured the hearing handicap of unilateral hearing loss, and we compared it to those people who had handicap as a result of uh, bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. There's a, uh, a self-assessment scale called a communication profile for the hearing impaired. It's an in-depth uh, communication profile. And we found that people with unilateral hearing loss had the same types of handicapping experiences as those with bilateral communication, well, bilateral hearing loss, with one exception. Those people reported that they communicated a little bit better in their home than people with bilateral hearing loss. But other than that, um, the, the results were, were equivocal with bilateral and unilateral hearing loss. And there was just a, a recent study that came out uh, from the National Acoustics Lab in, a store in, in Australia. And they interviewed 14 subjects, which would be a qualitative part of that study. And then they also uh, did a survey of 80 subjects. So it's a pretty good uh, sample. Um, even though the cause of the unilateral hearing loss varied, everyone still had that kind of a profile where one ear was normal and the other, hearing, the other ear had sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, so they looked at con congenital versus acquired. And when you have a a hearing loss as a result of an acoustic neuroma, that would be considered an acquired hearing loss. Congenital means that they've been born uh, with uh, hearing loss that's unilateral. So people who were born with hearing loss, unilateral hearing loss, uh, they were more likely to have developed frequent co coping mechanisms. So it was part of their development and they learned to live with it more effect effectively than people who acquired it later in life. They perceived less impact of the hearing loss on the quality of, a la of their lives, and they were less likely to use amplification devices. Those who acquired unilateral hearing loss later in life um, had a greater impact. Uh, they experienced feelings of panic. They experienced grief at losing the benefits of binaural hearing. Um, 
and they increased that uh, increased struggle with acceptance of the hearing loss. So in this study, they interviewed uh, 14 individuals. And I, I put down a couple of the quotes that people said about hearing loss. And, and I imagine some of you are going to relate to some of these quotes. Uh, when they looked at the functional impact of unilateral hearing loss, uh, there's an increased difficulty of listening in noise. Conversations can be unbearable, especially in loud places. There's difficulty with localization, trying to determine where the sound is coming from. So one of the subjects said, I feel almost blind on the left because I have no sense of someone being there and certainly can't hear them. And then there's reports of difficulty listening to music, listening in the car and participating in sports. The psychological impact of unilateral hearing loss, fear and anxiety was, was uh, repeated over and over again. I fear my good ear getting bad and my family and friends slowly dropping me out of their lives. Anxiety over thinking others think I am ignoring them. Those are, are uh, some quotes from, from the study. Uh, I know uh, me personally hearing, working with patients, that idea of what if something happens to my good ear is expressed to me all the time. That is a real fear. Uh, even though it's unlikely that anything is going to happen to the better ear, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a real, real fear that people have when they have unilateral hearing loss. There are issues with self-esteem and difficulty in social situations. It makes me feel broken, like I can't get simple instructions at work. I very rarely socialize in noisy environments as it's just too stressful and difficult. In the area of social and behavioral impacts of unilateral hearing loss, there's reduced social engagement. I've been married for 15 years and I still get into arguments with my spouse because I missed something that she said, uh, missing out on important information. People get easily frustrated that I can't hear them. And stigma in the workplace, I fear that if I have a hearing aid, people will automatically assume that I am fully deaf or incompetent to perform my job. The study concluded that only 20% of the uh, respondents reported they were coping well with unilateral hearing loss. Most reported they experienced a significant impact and acquired unilateral hearing loss had the most significant difficulties. Cross hearing aids, the ones that Dr. Gonzalez referred to that takes the sound from the poorer ear, transmits it over to the better ear. Those were the most common devices that were used with unilateral hearing loss. And um, that there's now that people are perceiving more increased discussions about cochlear implants for people with unilateral hearing loss. Uh, counseling strategies. Will I develop an acoustic neuroma on my other ear? Will I have to wear a hearing aid? What happens if I lose hearing in my other ear? How long will I have the hearing loss? These are real discussions that take place all the time when people have unilateral hearing loss as a result of acoustic neuromas. Um, it's part of our role as audiologists to counsel our patients about their hearing loss. Um, and in order for us to do that, we have to get a good sense of who the person is and how the hearing loss is affecting them. So the audiogram alone, as I've said, tells just very, uh, almost nothing at all. So we can provide something that some people refer to as educational counseling or informational counseling. We could go over the audiogram and we can describe what that means in terms of, of real life functioning. Uh, we could have people help to understand what the audiogram means. We talked a little bit about it earlier with the circles and the X's. Um, uh, we can identify changes that might occur during treatment, and we can discuss options that are available and with possible treatment results. Most importantly is our role in providing personal adjustment counseling, and that means carefully listening to affective statements, listening to statements that people might say um, that are emotional, that have some sense of feeling and some sense of emotion, and dealing with the feelings, because the feelings are real. And to just talk about hearing aids and not acknowledge the feelings uh, is not something that uh, 
uh, is uh, something that I want to do as an audiologist because we have to acknowledge your feelings and we know that that you're going through a, a large emotional response. Uh, we have to appreciate the emotional concerns. Um, we don't want to offer false hope, but we have to help you move towards acceptance of the hearing loss. Um, you know, we don't have outcomes that we would love to to say. We would love to say, oh, well, you put the hearing aid in and you're going to hear everything. It's going to be perfect. We know that just isn't true. Uh, but we want to be able to maximize whatever it is that you are capable of doing. Uh, communication partners and the environments. Um, I think it's really important that we include the family and significant others or friends in this counseling process. Uh, as I said earlier, by with Sam Triken's uh, slide about it's not hearing loss, it's communication loss, uh, it affects everyone. It doesn't just affect the person with hearing loss. Uh, that's why when I, when I go to our local uh, acoustic neuroma chapter, uh, frequently I see people there with their spouses or their kids. I see that at the Hearing Loss Association of America uh, when I go to their meetings that they come with family members and friends. Um, I just ran a panel for the Hearing Loss Association meeting where I had four sets of dyads. I had two sisters, one with hearing loss, one without. I had a, a mother and a daughter, and I had a husband and a wife. And we talked all about how hearing loss affects their communication and their interactions. And then we need to consider the strategies to help people to adjust uh, not only at home, but at work and in their social activities. Finally, I want you to remember that there are professionals out there who are willing to work with you and help you through that journey of adjusting to hearing loss. Um, you know, if, if you do get a hearing aid, it doesn't mean that the relationship with the audiologist who dispensed the hearing aid is over. It just means that it's beginning. And so it should be a, a, an opportunity for continuous support throughout the journey. Because when you have a journey of dealing with acoustic neuromas from its diagnosis that, that Dr. Gonzalez talked about um, beautifully in his case studies to some kind of intervention, whether it's surgical or, or radiation or gamma knife or, or, or watch and wait, um, Things change as you go along, and it's always good to have somebody that you have a relationship with to help you along on that journey. Uh, you always want to seek out someone who's going to provide the counseling that you need and help you develop the effective communication strategies that are, are so important when you deal with the psychosocial impact of hearing loss. And at this point, I think I'd like to bring this back to Melissa, and we'll uh, go from there. Okay. Well, thank you both for um, really, really informative presentations. They both had such great information. We've gotten actually several comments saying um, that the information has been really helpful. So um, if both of you want to turn on your webcams, if we want to give that a try, um, see if we can get that going. We have Dr. Montano. There we go. I know both of you that we can see, and we do have several questions. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the first one that I had was um, we've gotten a lot of questions on products that um, that people already have um, that help amplify sound, as you said, but they amplify all the sound. They amplify the background noise. They um, and they don't particularly help with clarity. So um, if people are looking to uh, find a new product. Is there, I know the technology has advanced, is there something that they should be looking for that can really help with clarity, help with reduction in background noise, but still amplify, you know, conversation and, and things to help them hear and be a part of, uh, of their group? You and me. <laughs> uh, well, I, can, I go ahead and tackle this one, I think, at least first. Uh, so uh, hopefully everybody can hear me well. I'm on speaker right now, so uh, if, if you can't, I apologize. I'll try to be as clear as I can. Uh, so one of the things that I think, uh, as I mentioned, technology has advanced pretty dramatically. The, the changes in, in circuitry, the changes in the microphone uh, adjustability, the patterns that the microphones pick up speech, the way that they can focus in a particular direction, uh, have really advanced what we can do with hearing aids anymore. So 
they're never going to be perfect. And, and in fact, audition, hearing in and of itself is really never perfect. Uh, you can't walk into a restaurant, even with normal hearing, and expect to hear only the conversation you want to hear. Our ears respond to any movement of air particles around us, and that's what, what sound is. That's what noise is. So the hearing aids are a, better able to do that uh, than what they used to be able to do. Uh, the, the unfortunate side of, to that, however, is that that really costs money, unfortunately. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the devices that, that you may find sort of just uh, over the counter uh, in a lot of places, they may not really be true hearing aids, and they are, they're not really adjustable in that sense, and therefore they're only going to be able to amplify. That's what they're really designed to do to help out with sort of mild to moderate losses. Uh, but really, if it's anything beyond that, uh, you really need to work with an audiologist. They can help really direct you to what is going to be the best technology available for those different things, and with the relationship that Dr. Montano mentioned that you have with us as audiologists, we're, we're able to work with you and figure out what's best for you in those circumstances. The hearing aids now can make adjustments uh, with cell phone apps that so you can change volume a little here or there. You can turn on one aid, leave the other one off. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do to, to modify uh, how you're going to react to that environment and how well you can listen. So it really is something that's it's hard to answer just in a single uh, statement. You really need to go see somebody. Sometimes you have to think out, uh, out of the box a little bit when you're looking about your hearing aids as well. You know, um, the microphones are, are phenomenal in the new hearing aids and they have beaming mics that can can focus in on somebody's direct speech. But, you know, as Dr. Gonzalez says, you're never going to get rid of the noise. The noise is going to be there. I mean, you know, um, one of the most effective ways that you can manage that is to use external microphones. Uh, sometimes assistive technology along with the hearing aids can really help. So if you're in a restaurant with a spouse and you have the person wear their own direct microphone that would transmit to your hearing, hearing aid, that would, would uh, certainly improve that ability to communicate in noise. Of course, if you're with a whole group of people, then it becomes difficult because, you know, you only have one microphone. They do have table mics, um, but but they do pick up a lot of noise as well. But the more direct the signal gets, the more directly the signal gets to the hearing aid, the better it is for you to hear even in noise. But, you know, we, we can't eliminate it. And noise, as, as Dr. Gonzalez says, is difficult for people with normal hearing as well. Right, right, okay. And um, is it is it the the frequency that makes speech so much difficult, more difficult to hear than noise, or or what is it that makes that so difficult to understand? Well, noise and speech have similar frequencies. You know, noise mm -hmm. noise is the same. You know, it, you know, if, if if you were to filter out all of the noise in a room, you would also be filtering out a lot of the speech signal. You know, so um, it's it's very difficult. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, Dr. Gonzalez, may... we may go ahead. Oh, sorry. I may go ahead no, and have I... you pick your phone back up because it is difficult to understand you. So, yeah, just do that. That's better. Oh, okay. Sorry. Is that better? <laughs> That's so, better. Uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to add, uh, sorry for the, the, the difficulty there. I, I wanted to add that, um, when again, when I pointed out earlier, vowels tend to be low frequencies, consonants tend to be high frequencies. Those different speech components, well, they're, you know, speech in and of itself is a very complicated uh, set of signals. It really is complex. What the hearing mechanisms actually do is really quite phenomenal when you go in and actually study what, how the, the auditory system works. We have to measure timing. We have to measure uh, inflection. We have to measure different voicing patterns. I mean, it really is very complex. Um, but, in, again, simplistic form. When we're looking for clarity, the clarity and the, the ability to, to distinguish between words is really done primarily through consonants. Knowing whether somebody said fat versus sat is really going to be something that's on the high frequency end. Um, and, but volume, the power of the, of, the, of the sound, is actually coming really from the, the low frequencies. The problem is that if we have a high frequency loss, which is not uncommon with, with an acoustic neuroma or even with aging, uh, what tends to happen is we tend to focus on what we can hear with the volume on the low frequency side and kind of make up the gaps. Background noise, as a general rule, tends to be low frequency. And the problem is that that then masks out the things you can hear 
and then that effectively just shifts your your hearing to make it as if it were worse than what it really is in that environment. So it, it's really uh, it, there, there's no simple answer, as Dr. Montano pointed out. You can't get rid of speech of, of background noise, excuse me, without compromising the speech sounds that you need to hear to understand what's being said. Sure. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, can we talk a little bit about um, how how patients that experience hearing loss, some of them become um, sensitive, pretty really sensitive in some cases to uh, loud noises or to um, certain sounds, uh, and why is that? And and do hearing aids help at all with that? Well. Um... Yeah, well, hearing aids. So, are you are you referring to? Uh, I mean, you know, so I'm I'm not sure. Are you talking about in the in the poorer ear? There's something called recruitment, where sound the patient specifically asked um, if a patient has single-sided hearing loss and their hearing is diminished a great deal. Yet sometimes noise and certain sounds bother them a lot. Um, why is that? In their better ear, I'm assuming that they're talking about. Yes. Sort of a, what mm -hmm. they call it a hyperacusis. Sort of, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that's that's not an uncommon condition for a lot of people. Uh, not necessarily related to acoustic aroma alone. It's uh, sure. you know it's very common for people to have that experience. Um, my advice always is uh, to protect the hearing. Um, I'm always nervous about somebody who has unilateral hearing loss. And so if you're in situations where you're exposed to loud noise or, or loud noise is troublesome to you, uh, the use of hearing protection or even getting uh, customized uh, hearing protection is a, a good recommendation because uh, you want to protect that good ear. Uh, hyperacusis is, is something that uh, is not uh, we don't, it's difficult to treat. Some some people go for cognitive behavioral therapies to deal with it, to cope with it. Um, a hearing aid uh, is not something that uh, you would use for hyperacusis. But if you have hearing loss and you're sensitive to noise, and yet we have to give you amplification, we have ways of limiting what the hearing aid can do. So we can find an area that uh, would be suited for you to hear amplified speech, but prevent the hearing aid from getting too loud that it becomes uncomfortable. Okay. All right, that makes sense. Um, another question about amplification. Uh, a patient says, you know, as you noted, there are that re reactions to unilateral, unilateral hearing loss are highly individual. Is there a device um, in your experience that uh, significant number of your patients agree is very helpful or are reactions to devices highly individual also? I would say that they tend to be very individualized. Um, so and it, it's pretty much like like going out to a restaurant. Some people like the, the soup. Other people hate the soup. Some people think it's too salty. Some people think it's not salty enough. Uh, and it's similar like that with, with the hearing aids because what they're basically designed to do, it just straight out of the box is just sort of amplify certain ways. We as the audiologists try to adjust those the best that we can. But even then, there's still some component of this which actually really is, is driven by the individual himself or herself. Uh, what their expectations are is going to color how they're going to deal with a hearing aid versus not. Um, what their hearing loss is, um, different environments where they may find themselves. There's, there's a lot that, that comes into this. Um, it's not so much a simple answer, but they tend to be very individualized. Um, you know, each individual manufacturer, they process sound slightly differently. Some uh, might emphasize high frequencies. Some might emphasize a little bit more low frequencies. Some might uh, have a different approach to how sound is, is re uh, released, if you will, to the ear, depending upon whether it's loud or not. And so each one of those is different, and some people like one thing, but they don't like the other. So there's really not an easy answer to that to come up with a simple one size fits all. Yeah, I, I would agree with that response. And the you know the other thing is that um, the beauty in our system here in America is that um, when you get hearing aids, most states provide you with at least a 30 day trial period. Uh, New York, we have a 45 day trial period by law. So um, 
you know, you do get to try the instrumentation, you could, you do get to wear it in your everyday environments, and you can make an assessment as to how effective it is, and then you can return and, and either try other things or uh, uh, make adjustments to how it's set and programmed. So uh, that is a nice safety net that we have when you purchase a hearing aids. Okay. Um, and then we've had lots of questions about tinnitus and um, whether or not certain hearing aids are more helpful with um, kind of coping with that or reducing the noise that people hear or anything like that. Have you found in your experience that there's uh, particular kinds of um, amplification products that work better than others? Well, that, that, That's that tough. Also, uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of, that, that varies. Um, so, you know, the, the manufacturers, uh, certain ones, they, they have their own particular mechanism by which they try to, to deal with the tinnitus. Uh, in general, the, the, the tinnitus itself is something that's really caused inside the head. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, it's not something that really can be fixed from the outside. Uh, but what we try to do with, with most of the manufacturers with hearing aids, what they'll do is they, they provide some kind of an auditory cue that that will be played along, which, uh, you know, ideally it's kind of like um, if you think about a, a song that comes on the radio, sometimes a song comes on the radio. If it's one you like, you may sing along. If it's one that you don't like or don't particularly care too much about, it's still on there, but you don't really pay much attention to it. So the idea is that they'll sometimes play little musical background notes, and then hopefully the tinnitus will sort of blend in with those, and then you kind of treat it like that song that you don't really care about on the radio, and you just kind of learn to ignore it. Um, that works with varying degrees of success. Some individuals do really well with it. Some people don't. Uh, some people just have background noise. Some people uh, just the presence of actual the sounds that they have not heard in a while actually will kind of reduce some of the tinnitus that they have. Uh, but there, there's really no magic way for us to predict how that's going to work. Um, even the response that the patient has. Some people it's it's some people have terrible tinnitus, but they just go, eh, all right, whatever, I just go with it. Other people have very minimal tinnitus, and it's the, the most annoying thing that, that's on the planet. Um, and, and so everybody's perception and everybody's reaction to that varies as well. So it's something that we as audiologists will work with the patients to try to find out what might work best in that particular circumstance for the individual. But there, there's really not one magical one that works. A lot of it has to do with how we can work with you to make maximize what that's doing for you. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have also had a lot of questions about insurance coverage and the fact that generally it is not um, hearing aids are not insur uh, covered by insurance because they're considered cosmetic. Um, do you have any suggestions for what patients can um, do to try and get insurance to pay for these kinds, of, or at least pay toward the costs associated with hearing amplification? Well, that, that is our continual battle. So, so I, I, those of you who are not involved with the Hearing Loss Association of America, HLAA, it is a national group of people with hearing loss, and they make um, a lot of noise. <laughs> so they, they have a large uh, group throughout the country, and they do a lot of lobbying. And, you know, people can't understand why hearing aids are not covered by Medicare. Um, and because it affects most, you know, a lot of people who are older. Uh, and, and the HLAA has been very, very effective uh, reaching legislators and, and trying to advocate for insurance coverage for hearing aids. I will say in my years of practice that more and more companies are beginning to, to cover hearing aids, at least minimally, uh, but still the vast majority do not. But um, I think advocacy is really, really important, um, and the, the the louder you speak about it, the more legislators will listen. Sure. Okay. Agreed. And, and there's also the complexity of uh, one insurance provider; it will cover it. If you have a certain policy with, let's say, uh, and I'm just making up something, if if you're in the state's teachers union, they'll cover it there. Uh, that with, let's say, Blue Cross or whatever. Uh, but if you are in the rail Railroad Workers Union, they won't cover it. And it, it, there's there's a whole lot of complexity with that uh, yeah. as well. So it, it really is a very big challenge for us. Um, and, and Medicare sure. okay. generally doesn't cover at all. So. Right. 
we're coming up to the close to the um, end of our time, but I want to ask one other question um, about um, how much how much experience. Or, or I guess as patients come in and talk to you, do you have a lot of patients that come in and talk to you about fatigue? We hear on, on the ANA site about um, uh, patients who have been told that uh, their brain is really busy trying to listen and trying to hear, and so that is uh, some cause for some of their fatigue. Is that something that you hear a lot? Is, that, is there any truth to that? What is your experience with that? I would actually say that there is some truth to that. Um, one of the things that I've I've done for a long time, I'm also uh, I do a lot of work with vestibular imbalance disorder patients, and what ends up happening with them is a very similar uh, uh, idea here, in that they're so focused on trying to make sure that they're stable and not falling and not spinning and and doing what they can to stabilize their environment, it takes a lot out of them mentally, um, and so they they are fatigued by the end of the day typically, and that's not uh, surprising, and I have heard that from patients as mm -hmm. well, because you're trying to hear out of your better ear while competing with all the additional noise. Uh, one of the problems that we have if you only have one ear hearing well is that you tend to localize sound all in that direction. Uh, part of the sure. reason for that is that the brain figures out where sound originates from by partly which ear gets it louder. So if one ear always hears better than the other, it's always going to seem like it's on that side. So that's really the challenge uh, that patients have. So you have to sort of realize, okay, it's not from over there, it's from over there. Where is it coming from? Uh, does it make sense? Is it there's too much noise and a lot of things that are competing that actually make fatigue uh, not, not a surprising component? When, when I address that issue with my patients, I frequently use this um, analogy. It's, I, you know, you think of it as a passive and active uh, phenomenon listening. You know, so listening can be passive where, you know, when you have good hearing, you don't have to worry about it, right? You know, it's there, you hear it, you can do things, you can do other things. But when you have hearing loss, it's an active process. You have to pay attention, you have to work at it. It can't be passive. And uh, so I, I think that's what contributes to the fatigue. So you're working, I mean, you're working. Mm -hmm. The brain is working, mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're consciously working to listen. That makes sense. Okay, so um, that is going to be the end of our um, presentation today. We're at the end of our time. So that will have to be the last question. I do want to thank Dr. Montano and Dr. Gonzalez for taking the time to speak to us. And I want to thank everyone who attended. A recording of the webinar will be available on the ANA website later this week or early next. Um, please join us tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Time for a Facebook Live presentation with Dr. Gina Angley from Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She and a ANA Director Allison Feldman will discuss improving communication between speaker and listener for those affected by hearing loss. And as Dr. Montano said earlier, this, you know, a lot of this is about communication. Um, you can access that event tomorrow at 3 Eastern by going to our Facebook page. Um, and don't forget to visit our website at www.anausa.org for information and updates on how to get involved with ANA. Again, doctors, thank you both so much for great presentations and for providing us with such great information. And thank you to everyone who's attended, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.